Hi, this is Bill Arnold. Missed a show or need me talking to help you sleep tonight? I have several solutions to that situation. Here are the podcasts from the show. You are the best for listening and supporting Faith Radio. And a warm welcome to the afternoon show. I'm Bill Arnold. I have a quote that's been floating around in my head for years, and I I love it. And it's from a man that I was mentored by for a little while. He's now gone home to be with the Lord. But here's what he said. God makes you an incredible offer. You can give your life in exchange for the same thing for which Jesus spent his life. People. People last forever. For good or bad, they are eternal. Spend your life helping them prepare for eternity. Don't give your life to mediocrity. Life is too short and the issues of eternity too significant. That was said by Walt Hendrickson. And when I think of the people that I know who have not yet come to faith, who have not yet uh, discovered what it's like to be part of God's family, adopted into his family, I, I feel a little anxious to make sure I'm doing everything I can to be connecting to them, to be in front of them, to be loving them, to be encouraging them. Because when I see that somebody has passed on and they left this world not having believed in the Lord, in the Lord uh, and Savior Jesus, I, I, sh- I shake. I just think, oh no, they've entered a Christless eternity. And there's nothing more profound than that. And I was having a conversation with my friend uh, Trevor Rubenstein, and he was feeling the very same way, that there is an incredible need to um, reach out to people, to be evangelists. And then I was thinking, when I grew up, and you know, doing evangelism in, in the 70s, when I would whip out the four spiritual laws and try to go from start to finish and, and leave with uh, a, a new convert, I thought, well, no, my mindset has really changed. I need to rethink how I do evangelism today. It might be something as a simple word you give to the cashier at the grocery store. It might be something you simply say to someone that, uh, whose paths you cross. And that is the beginning of something. That's the seed of something. That is, you are part of the process. It's not all on your shoulders. So here to have that wonderful discussion about evangelism today is uh, my friend Trevor. He is with Chosen People Ministries. You might also recognize him from my segment, At Least Two Jews and a Gentile. Trevor, welcome back. Oh, thanks, Bill. It's always a blessing to be here and um, really moved even uh, by the quote that you gave earlier. Uh, I've just had this incredible conviction lately of the um, lack of evangelism that we have done as the church. And I'm not sure if you've seen any of the statistics on it, Bill, as to how many Christians actually ever share their faith with anyone, but it's, it's, it's sad. Mm. Um, And so that really as a church, we're, we're failing in something. Sometimes the, the approach was uh, just inviting people to church. But uh, if someone's uncomfortable in coming to church because they don't know Jesus, then they're kind of left out in the wilderness. And I think that we as the body just have to become much more effective in sharing with people as we interact with them throughout the week. Mm-hmm. Now, Trevor, I, I love your story, your testimony, because uh, you grew up in a conservative Jewish home. So how does a conservative Jewish kid from the northern Minnesota come to faith in Jesus. Yeah, well, first they have to move out of northern Minnesota because that's what all the Jewish people did, Bill. But, right. uh, and my family did too. And we were, uh, when I was young, I was about 10 years old, and, and we moved into the Colorado area. Um, and, you know, and I was troubled, Bill. I, I, I suffered from depression and, and suicidal. And, you know, I was involved with drug and alcohol abuse, as we talked about previously. But uh, um, eventually, after I was uh, expelled from school, I ended out in a... Uh, in a local community college. Uh, actually, I, I, I was never taught. Uh, I, I was never taught that there was any opportunity for someone once they were kicked out of high school. But I found out that actually you could get something called a GED and go to a community college. Mm-hmm. And so, 
So that's what I did. But while I was there, I befriended a, a guy, um, and I was kind of uh, alone. Most of my friends had left and moved away, and, and I was stuck there because of my earlier decisions. And uh, he offered for me to join him with something, and uh, and if I heard him, I wouldn't have done it. So, because as a Jewish person, even though I didn't believe in God at this point, uh, just having Jewish ancestry, we, we have a very strong understanding that we just can't believe in Jesus. It, it was more okay for me to be an atheist than it would have been a Christian. Oh, so you actually misheard what he said. Yeah. yeah you agreed to something that you would have otherwise refused. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and so uh, he, he asked if I would be part of a Bible study. Um, or join him. And, and I, apparently I agreed. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, and then I had excuses of course, because, uh, to get out of it. Oh yeah. Every, oh, every excuse imaginable. Yeah. Um, but he was persistent. God bless him. You know, I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't have a Bible. I don't, you know, I, yeah. I'm Jewish. I, I would use right. these things. I just hurt my rotator cuff. I mean, you make up anything, don't you? <laughs> anything and everything. <laughs> and, and he invited us to this, uh, to this study and, and, uh, and he handed out Bibles, um, cause they had them. And he, and he said, open to Luke chapter 15. It was a parable of the prodigal son. And, and he asked me, he said, have you ever read the Bible before? I said, yeah, sure. I've read it. I never read it, Bill. Um, I actually don't trust people anymore when they tell me that they <laughs> read the Bible. But, but, uh, um, but, so, uh, but I looked next to me and I saw where the lady next to me had opened up her Bible and I opened to the same section. So I was able to find Luke 15 and, and he said, wow, you found that fast. I said, yeah, I told you I read this before, but, um, oh, so uh, your smarty pants uh, is working. Uh, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Um, but, but anyway, uh, what I wasn't expecting was the first time I read the words of Jesus was also the first time I ever felt the presence of God. Um, and, uh, and so really three things became real. So, so I'm a Jewish person reading the words of Jesus and all of a sudden I, I get overwhelmed. I was very familiar with highs. I had never experienced anything like this before and I wasn't on anything. I had actually been clean for months at this point and, and, and I'm reading these words and just this overwhelming feeling comes over me and, and, uh, and I knew it was God. It was strange. How do you know? I don't know. I knew it was him. Mm -hmm. And and I, I recognized that everything I was doing in my life was separating me from him because there was also a recognition of how holy he is. And, and then, but then there was this thing that was more powerful than the conviction, which was the love of the Lord. And, and I knew that I could come to know him through Jesus. And I struggled with this, right? I, I, uh, I didn't accept him at that very moment, although the work was done. But uh, I struggled with it, and eventually in a week time, I just professed Jesus, and he changed my life, Bill. Like, I I, I wouldn't be alive today. No. I, I had no meaning, no purpose. And, and even the things that I thought were meaningful, Bill, now I recognize how fleeting it is and, and how meaningless. But, but for me, with Jesus being the difference between life and death, because I would have killed myself if I didn't accept him. I was, I was working on that actively. Um, but, uh, he was the difference between life and death. And, and so I, I know so many people actually, I was the first Christian I knew, um, as I have stated with you before, this group wasn't even Christian. They were actually a cult. Um, but, but they used the Bible and so it was actually the words of Jesus. But, but all that aside, all that aside, he changed me and, and I now loved people in a deeper way. I, I loved God. I was connected to him. I was reconciled to him. I, I didn't want to die anymore. I wanted to live for him. And, and and so my heart then became, when I look at all of the people that I knew who didn't know Jesus was, oh my gosh, they need to know him. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Bill, life without him is horrible, but eternity without him is infinitely worse. And we can only come to know God through the sacrifice, through the, through the sacrificial death of Jesus. It's the only way we can be reconciled to him. And, and then he gives us life abundant and, and he gives us eternal life in his presence. And, and, and really something that strikes me is how much would I have to hate somebody to not share Jesus with them? And shouldn't we love people in a deeper manner and understanding how lost they are. And, and you know, we, we can look at the sinfulness of humanity, which of course makes sense because if we don't have Jesus, we are lost.
And so instead of writing people off in these things, I think that we need to be more broken hearted and even reaching out to them more. And that really became my focus, Bill, is, is reaching lost people. And by the grace of God, I'm able to do that as a profession, but it's not enough that I'm doing it, Bill. It's like the church needs to move. Yeah, Trevor, if I can quote an old movie from Back to the Future, you get in that silver car and you go back in time and all of a sudden you're a teenager or a young kid in college who feels desperate, alone, and suicidal. Had you been successful at staying on that road and committing suicide, you'd be in a Christless eternity right now. Bill, can you imagine? I, I, Trevor, I'm almost shaking to think that I'm looking at you across the studio from me, my friend, who loves the Lord Jesus with all his heart, mind, and soul and wants to do everything he can in his time on this earth to bring others to faith in Christ. Bill, that's that's where I was heading. Yeah. And, and, and now looking back, and I unfortunately know many people who have gone that route at this point in my life, and, and it's crushing, and it should be crushing to all of us. We We need to be so desperate for the loss, Bill. It needs to motivate every component to our life while we're here on this side of eternity. You know, Paul Paul has this this fascinating statement in Philippians chapter 1, right, where where Paul says this in verse 23, he says, "For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better." So what he's saying is that for those of us that are believers in Jesus, of course it's better if we're with him. It doesn't mean we hasten it by any means, but right. it's just a better place to be. There's no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain. We're in the place that we were designed to be from the very beginning. But then he goes on in verse 24 and says this, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Mm -hmm. And we're here for a purpose. And God, God has us here. He allows us to remain in this hurting world, not for ourselves anymore, but now it's instead for how we can propagate the gospel, how we can further the kingdom of God. And, and we, every Christian, every Christian is called to this without exception. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic uh, verse that you just shared and how significant and important it is for all of us to be reminded on a daily basis, how critical it is to be bold risk takers for the gospel. And Trevor, in this uh, hour, I want to talk about how I think I have needed to reframe how I think about evangelism. And I know you asked me about that in the parking lot. And I said, I, I, I used to think that I'd, I'd pull out the four spiritual laws and go from start to finish all in one conversation. And now I realize the value of planting a seed, being part of a process of evangelism, where when someone comes to faith in Christ, there might have been 61 other people that mm. made a contribution to that person's faith journey. And then it's that one person that, you know, may end up praying with them in their moment of decision, and they feel like they walk away as something more significant than what they really are, because it's the 61 people that led up to it. Yeah, ab absolutely. I don't... Have, have I ever told you the story about the uh, famous photographer, Bill, the Jewish famous photographer? Well, that I can't. The gospel I with? can't wait to hear it, and okay. I think we should do it at the other side of the break. Okay. We call that in radio a cliffhanger. Yeah. So people aren't going anywhere now, Trevor. They're going to sit <laughs> still. So uh, Trevor Rubenstein is my guest. He is with Chosen People Ministries. Is it chosenpeople.org? Dot com, yeah. Dot com, chosenpeople.com. Trevor's a Messianic Jew. You probably know him from my show, At Least Two Jews and a Gentile. He's one of my esteemed panelists. All right, we're going to take a break. Be right back. How nice to have Trevor Rubenstein with me today. He is with Chosen People Ministries, chosenpeople.com is how you can learn more about him and his powerful ministry. He's a Messianic Jew. Do I say that right, Trevor? Do you care how I say it? It sounded good to me, Bill. Yeah, you're of a Jewish tradition, and you became a believer in Jesus, and you still do ministry mostly to reach the people in the Jewish community. Yeah, it's our focus, Bill, yeah. is to reach Jewish people with saving faith in Jesus. And, uh, and we've talked about this briefly on this show, but... 
but in a time to where really uh, faith is diminishing um, as a whole, it seems like when you look at all the statistics in the country, the Jewish people are actually increasing tremendously mm-hmm. in faith in Jesus. So, so it's a wonderful ministry to be part of and uh, really blessed to see God moving amongst this people that have, uh, um, for the most part, rejected Jesus for 2,000 years. So yeah. it's gone. All right, right before the break, you teased us about a, a Jewish photographer that you were going to tell an amazing story on. So let's hear it. Yeah, so uh, so there's a... We we met a young man um, when we were doing outreach, actually, at a New Age festival. I, isn't that cool? It, it just let, let me touch on this really <laughs> quick. I, I think this is worthwhile to touch on. Is um, it, the the Hebrew scriptures? All right, the the Old Testament scriptures were largely um, about quarantine. The idea was is that sin spreads like disease. So you would isolate yourself from the world because you could catch what they have, right? But when we come to the New Testament scriptures, we now have the cure for the disease. Amen. So where in the Hebrew scriptures, they were instructed, you know, avoid these people, stay away from them because you could now actually, if we have Jesus, if we're truly his follower, we can go into these places where people don't know the Lord to share him. It's important we don't try to separate ourselves because then we're simply allowing them to fall into condemnation. But we go to these places to share Jesus. And so we were at a New Age Festival uh, um, and and there was this young man that came up to us and he said how how peaceful it was with us and he really appreciated it and we would set up like a tent called the prayer station um, and uh, do you mind if I give a little plug for the ministry? Oh, Bill? please, so by this, all means. This is with Street Level Ministries, yeah. which has been around here in Minnesota for a long time. And uh, and this young Jewish, he was a Jewish man, and, and he had come to faith in Jesus. And so he was really excited when he got to know me and saw we were doing an outreach in this new age group that he was there really to reach out to. And so he joined us and was working with us. And it turned out that his dad was a world-famous photographer. His dad, father's name is Steve Shapiro. He passed away uh, a while ago. But Steve, uh, Steve was like a photographer for Muhammad Ali, for uh, all the different movie studios, for Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, they, I, I saw some of the pictures. They're spectacular. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, a Jewish man, right? Uh, not particularly religious, but, but his son, who actually had changed his name to Theophilus. <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. Yeah. Um, he, he wanted to start doing spiritual things with his dad. And, uh, and so he... But one of the things that he did was he he wanted him to meet with me, right? So so we so he introduced us, and this was just on the phone. But he was going to spend time with his dad doing spiritual things. So he wanted his dad to know Jesus, and so I talked with I talked with him for probably an hour and a half, Bill, and and I went into such depth of Jesus being the promised Messiah, about him fulfilling the promises made in the Hebrew Scriptures, about him living out the specific instructions that were given to Israel and, and he dies on the Passover and he raises from the dead on first fruits and on Pentecost or Shavuot. He, the Holy Spirit comes upon, I went into all this detail and this depth with Steve. And at the end of our conversation, he said to me, so are you telling me that Jesus's last name isn't Christ? Wow. That was that was the conclusion. Wow. <laughs> it was, I did all this work Talk about deflating, <laughs> and 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 uh, you know, it, it was like, okay, well, I guess uh, this didn't go well. But uh, later, actually, um, later, his son reached out to me, and uh, and he thanked me, and he said, uh, he said, I just wanted you to know, you know, you know, my dad had passed. He said, but he he was baptized and he came to faith in wow, Jesus fantastic and he said that wow. you know what you did was a part of what contributed mm-hmm. and and he didn't get much out of what i stated as far as i could tell but but it's uh it takes sometimes and I, and i forget the statistics i, I learned, knew this at one time but it, it takes multiple times typically for people to hear the gospel before it touches them on average sometimes you know it could be quicker with different individuals sometimes slower but um but a seed was planted right and uh, and it effectively built upon what other people were able to pour into in his life to truly lead him to faith. Mm-hmm. And uh, and by the grace of God, as an older man, um, which is rare, uh, came to faith in Jesus. And today, Bill, I mean, he's he's with our Lord. Yeah. Tre- Trevor, can I just say you did a spectacular job planting that seed? I mean, we have to almost 
ask, what does a planted seed look like? And I would say, there's the the poster boy right there um, for how to do it. I mean, you, you laid out the, the gospel beautifully to him. Yeah, and you so know... How do we plant a seed if we don't have time to lay out the gospel? Yeah, and uh, and it just depends on every situation. I think... I think a problem that we have sometimes, Bill, is that we uh, we we make plans, right? And, uh, <laughs> yes. And we we have strategies, and I'm going to do it this way, and I'm going to use this, and um, and I think it's better to trust in the Holy Spirit and to trust in the Lord's leading, and to not put so much pressure on ourselves, Bill. I think one of the reasons that people don't share Jesus is because they're putting too much pressure on themselves. Sometimes what we do is we'll uh, we'll just walk around and ask people if we can pray for them, and then we lead that into a deeper religious discussion. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we, uh, my gosh, Bill, as, as I was telling you earlier, and I, you know, I've I've focused on apologetics and studying those things for most of my life, but it is actually most of my life at this point. But uh, I think more effectively, they're more effective sometimes than the uh, intellectual communication is expressing our love, concern, and deep desire for other people to enter into eternity with us, to share what God did in our lives and tell them, I know this is real, and because I love you so much, I want this for you too. Because as you said, our our eternity goes in one and two directions. It's either eternal condemnation or eternal life. And uh, and I think that we just really have to more with more of a heartfelt uh, desire, even plead with people to come to know the Lord. You know this section. I'm okay with that. Oh, amen. Yeah, Bill. I'm okay with the pleading part. Amen. It, you know th- this this section in uh, in Second Corinthians chapter five um, comes to mind, where uh, where Paul is writing. And he's he's talking about this ministry that we have, right? And uh, and this is what he says, starting in verse sixteen. And this is again Second Corinthians chapter five. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold. All things have become new. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself. We've been reconciled to him, Bill, through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He he brought us to him, not just simply so that we can be with him. That's not the end of it. That's the beginning. But also so because now he wants us to share with others and he wants us to, to really to plead with them. I mean, the, the, the work that we're doing, Bill, and basically I think is uh, I've met Jesus and now what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to take the hand of the individual I'm sharing with and reach out to the hand of Jesus and have their hands linked so that they can meet one another, Bill. Mm -hmm. And and so what does it take? What does it take to get them? Sometimes we don't have all the tools, Bill, but we sure can share with them our love and care and concern and the reality of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Mm -hmm. Trevor Rubenstein is my guest, and we're talking about how critical it is for us to never take our foot off the gas when it comes to initiating conversations and Trevor, you know how easy it is. You're at the gym, and I can say to somebody, "Hey, did you watch the game yesterday?" That's very easy to do. Yeah, it takes nothing, right? There's no risk. I could have just as easily said, "Did you go to church yesterday, by any chance? Are you a church guy?" Yeah, and they can they can say, "I we used to be, but not anymore." Yeah, or yeah, I went. So all of a sudden, you've got an instant connection, and it. The, I I still think the risk is really low. Yeah, Bill, and. and and people are desperate. They are. Yeah, we forget that. And, yeah. and you know, something that, that struck me recently is uh, um, every time I preach, okay, now, every time I preach, and I, and I preach almost every weekend in different churches around, uh, around the area, um, I make sure that I share the gospel. And sometimes when I'm there, 
okay. Sometimes when I'm there, I'm, I'm very confident that the people here are believers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe a smaller venue, everyone knows each other kind of thing. But I still want to share the gospel every time because I think one of the reasons that people don't share is they feel insecure in being able to present it. And yet the gospel is so simple. Like you said, the introductions can be easy, right? Yeah. But then how do we present the gospel after that? And, and, and I, th I think that there's a very clear, concise way. This is, this is how I've been presenting it. it. It starts with who God is, right? God is eternal, meaning God is the uncreated creator of all things. He always was. He is and he always will be. So God is directly linked to eternity. And then one of the things that he creates is us. And when we sin, when we act in a way, what that really is, is it's acting in a way contrary to the character and nature of God that separates us from him. Because we can't be with him. We can't, you can't have light and dark at the same place at the same time. And so what, what ends up happening then is when you separate yourself from God, you also separate yourself from eternity, from eternity with the Lord. We really do. And, and so the result of that is death. And so what God did, because he recognized that the result of our sin leads to death and destruction and condemnation, is he sent his son down and he what God did, in essence, is he puts on a tent of human flesh. He walks among us, lives a perfect life, and he takes that punishment of death, that suffering that we earned upon himself, so that then if we put our faith and trust in Jesus, then he did the suffering for us, and now we can be reconciled to Jesus or to the Lord. We mm -hmm. can be reconciled to God for all of eternity. And, and so it's this idea of, well, why does he have to die? Well, because that's what I earned. That was the consequence of what we did. And, and well, why am I separated from him? Because when you're contrary to his character and nature, you can't dwell in his presence no. anymore. And, and, and so you separate yourself from eternity in that process, but yet he loves us so much that he wants Wanted to reconcile us back there. Very simple. Yeah, right? I love, and, love and I think simplicity. it helps people to understand. Yeah, we're going to take a little break. Uh, Trevor Rubenstein is my guest. He is with ChosenPeople.com. We're talking about the most wonderful thing we can do to the people that we know and love, and if we really love them, we tell them the truth. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining me today. If you just uh, climbed in your car, I have Trevor Rubenstein as my guest. You may know him from at least two Jews and a Gentile, a segment that I do twice a month. And we are talking about the the way in which we should feel a real sense of urgency for the lost. And maybe the lost is in your family, in your neighborhood, and where you work. And we need to keep our eyes fixed on the prize, which is uh, Jesus. So, Trevor, we would certainly be the envy of every first century believer. We have the entire revealed Word of God. Yet, I hear a lot of things that sound like nonsense, the way people in the world describe heaven and hell. And I think that's probably exactly what the enemy wants, mm -hmm. to use language that is so uh, jovial or fluffy or unrealistic that you really don't take either too seriously. Yeah. And, and, you know, you've, you've probably heard before, uh, uh, people joking about, uh, wanting to go to hell because that's where all the fun people are anyway. And, and what a, what a sad depiction. Um, it, you know, it, it, this warm place with a, a little red guy with a pitchfork or something like that. But, yeah. You know, this is eternal torment and stuff. I, I know. And then there's this idea that heaven is this boring place where you're going to be sitting on a cloud with a harp. And I think there again, there's horrible language and images used to depict heaven. Yeah. And the, the scripture describes heaven is in some places being almost undescriptable because of its beauty and its majesty. And when the Lord uh, really establishes 
um, his kingdom, it, it's it's going to be something, Bill, that, uh, I mean, just imagine the most beautiful, amazing place with everything that you could ever desire, and that's where you will dwell. But then, in addition to that, imagine everything that you were created to be, to have fulfilled, because you were created to be in fellowship with God, to be healed completely by him to be loved perfectly and this is where we'll be able to be bill it's like uh it's like the 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 greatest relationship we could ever conceive of times infinity bill and I know. and that's where we'll dwell and we're able to praise him and some people think well i'd get tired or no you're not going to have any physical limitations right um it, it, it's it's you'll be able to be in the perfect place with the perfect God and with those who we love for all of eternity. And why would we separate ourselves from something like that, Bill? It's an opportunity for everyone. It costs us nothing. It cost him everything. And, and by mean it cost us nothing. I don't mean that there's, that this world becomes easy if we become believers in Jesus. Sometimes it becomes difficult. Sometimes we're hated, but but meaning we don't have to earn our own righteousness. Uh, we are given the righteousness of God because Jesus died for us. And then if we accept him, if we believe that he's our Lord and Savior, he sends his Holy Spirit to dwell in us, in which case we are reconciled to him. And I can tell you, Bill, even just on this side of eternity, life's better. Life's better with Jesus. Uh, my my wife and I were talking about, uh, you know, we 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 do ministry for fun. It's <laughs> uh, we we don't have to, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as as believers, if if a believer desired to, they can still go back to sinful things. But we don't want to. We 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 desire to do what's good because it it's just a better life mm-hmm. Bill, in, in every way, shape, and form. There's peace. You know, it's not so much chaos. There's not the constant ups and downs of life. And, and when we live in sin, you know, I, I've, I've thought about this and, uh, um, sometimes people struggle, right, with, uh, with, with, uh, of course we all do, but, but they struggle with the, the desires to sin. And, and sometimes people don't even want to come to faith because they want to live a sinful life. But, but what they don't understand is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the creator of you and me. He understands us better than we could ever understand each other. He gives us instructions not to take away a really cool party. He gives us instructions because he knows what's best for us. He knows how we can avoid heartache, we can avoid suffering, we can avoid these type of things that we can enter into ourselves through sin. And, and so it makes sense, of course, even in this life alone, to follow the Lord, let alone eternity. When Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world, I think when we reconcile ourselves to the understanding, Trevor, that there is suffering, and when you read Scripture, it's a suffering person on every page talking about suffering, that when we come to the point of saying, I understand that this life is much, much suffering. Yeah. I think we're happier people. Yeah. Every commercial you see on TV, um, it's the family on the beach, and they appear to be the only family on the beach. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that life is easy as a believer, right, Bill? No, no. It's it. Sometimes it's more. It's harder. Correct. But there's something that happens. I I remember hearing this story as a very young believer, um, where there was a, a a very successful man that was not a believer in Jesus, and he was at my church, and he he was talking about before he was a believer in Jesus, and he was having playing golf with a man, and a and the man asked him. He said, "Do you know the difference between uh, between?" happiness and inner peace. And I, I just remember this story. This was like 30 years ago now that I heard him preach this. And, and he said no. But he was very curious because as a very successful individual, he was always seeking this, this joy, right? And the man said, well, well happiness comes from the word happenstance, which has to do with instances. So you, things that can that can give you moment momentary appreciation. So like you you get a new girlfriend, you get married, you you get a new car, you get a new job. He said, but all those things are fleeting. He said, inner peace is having joy no matter how difficult the situation is. And you can only have that if you have a relationship with Jesus. And that's mm-hmm. really how we live our life, Bill. Uh, it, it's I think the world can be falling apart, but I can still find joy in the Lord. Mm. 
That's so good. Trevor Rubenstein is my guest. Trevor, when you were talking about a sermon you heard a long time ago, it reminded me of a sermon I heard a long time ago, and I still have this image in my head. And the illustration was when the friends were lowering their paralytic friend uh, through the roof uh, to be in front of Jesus. The question was, are you a roof ripper? Are you going to be willing to rip off some tiles to get a person in front of Jesus? Yeah. I Amen. Thought, That's a good, good image. Amen. You know, yeah. are, are you willing to do some, some of the work and some of the, the, the work that might feel a little, uh, a little, a little risky? Yeah. And, and it, and it is Bill. It, it is, is of yeah. course. And, and, and I don't, uh, I'm sure other people understand that, but, uh, I mean, being in Jewish ministry, of course, we, we understand this uh, completely where, um, the one thing that really distances you from your entire community is Jesus. Mm-hmm. And uh, I love the Jewish people. I mean, they're wonderful, kind, amazing people, but there's a blindness towards the Lord. And, and of course, there's a massive risk in sharing Jesus with anybody. And and uh, I've experienced that. But, but Bill, it, how can we go on and allow somebody's blood to be on our hands? I mean, how can I... If I love somebody, how can I not try to start sharing or or even to give them an expression of my own personal situation? So something that's very inoffensive, right, typically is just sharing my testimony. What did God do in my life, right? <laughs> Who has he been for me? How has he saved me? And, 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 you know, you can argue against me telling you what you need to do as a non-believing person, but it's hard for you to argue against you tell, against me telling you what God did for me. You can't. No. Yeah. And so there's simple ways of doing those things and, uh, and, and just simply telling people that we love them and we want to see them in eternity. This is how we believe this occurs. You know, I mean, these, it's, it's just, it's showing someone not that you're trying to control their life, but instead that you love them enough to want to be with them forever. Mm-hmm. Trevor, you talked earlier about how it's not necessarily easy. Becoming a believer can be hard. I will I will piggyback on that and say I'd rather it be hard and right than hard and wrong. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And, and and absolutely, Bill. It's uh, yeah. What, what a what an interesting concept because sometimes I think that people choose even what they know is wrong because they uh, they worry about what it would be like without those things. Sin can become comfort for oh, us, oh, definitely. And, and sometimes we even will seek comfort in sinful actions. And so we think, well, what would my life be like without this? Even uh, people I've known, of course, throughout many years, some people seek unhealthy relationships because they're used to it. Um, But the truth is good. The truth is right. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, of course, opens up everything for us. It's amazing when you open yourself up to deception in one area, how many other areas of your life can also be deceived. Um, but the deception ultimately leads to sin, which leads to death. Um, and not just, uh, not just temporarily, also eternally, Bill. It is a, there's a eternal condemnation for those who reject Jesus. Mm-hmm. Trevor, talk about how tradition is sometimes more powerful than truth. Because I know that you've mentioned earlier about your people in the Jewish community that are, are probably more committed to their tradition than they are the truth. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And, and your culture can mean so much to you. And right. of course, there's many cultures that develop around uh, traditions that might not be linked to truth. We we would recognize this. So, for example, uh, nobody, for the most part, really believes in in uh, Greek uh, polytheism anymore, no. but this is very much the Greek culture. Yeah. And so, um, or was at one time, I should say, and, and Rome also, but there, but there's, there's this, uh, this thing to where um, it's difficult to transition away from that because you feel like you're not just leaving, uh, you're not just leaving one thought for another, but you're leaving everything that your family has always been. You're leaving everything that your community has always been. And and there can be real loss, but Jesus promises us. He says anyone that gives up mother, brother, sister, loved ones in this world will receive many, many times more. And, uh, and I've experienced that, Bill. So 
Uh, so even, and I, I, here's an interesting, just kind of brief story I, I can share with you. You know, when I came to faith, my family was very gracious by the grace of God. Often that's not the case with Jewish people, um, but they were gracious. They, they didn't dismiss me as a person. They just uh, said, oh, well, he was never Jewish to start or oh, something like no. that. But, but, but something that struck me, well, the first time I went to Israel, Bill, and I, I didn't, I knew one person I didn't know. And, and I had, I was there for like two months. Every night, and I had hotels reservations, but but every night, with the exception of two nights when I was there for like two months, I ended up staying with people that I just met because they were Christians, Bill, and were brothers and sisters in the Lord. Just met them, but were real family in a wow. real sense. Here. Opening their home to you, yeah. So wh- I, you lose something, but what you gain is much more. Mm-hmm. All right, we're gonna take a little break. If you've got questions about what it means to begin. A relationship with Christ, you can text the word faith to 41224. That's text the word faith to 41224. I'll be right back with Trevor Rubenstein in just a minute. So glad to be back with Trevor Rubenstein. Trevor, as we chat about how important it is to share our faith and to take a risk, start a conversation, don't feel like you have to bring the whole message of the gospel the first time you have a conversation with people. Maybe what you just need to do is look them in the eye, smile at them, tell them that um, that you're a Christian, and that might be all that God asks you to do in that moment. Yeah. Yeah, Bill. It, it, it doesn't take much. Uh, you know, you ask someone, uh, can I pray for you today? Yeah. How are you doing? And, you know, as they tell you with their, they explain their struggles, often we're able to tell people, well, you know, uh, this is how I deal with it. And we talk about our relationship with Jesus. Um, you know, it's just, it's caring for other people, I think, largely. Mm-hmm. and. You know, sometimes we think, well, uh, you know, I wasn't called to be an evangelist. Uh, it's interesting. Scripture doesn't seem to give us that excuse. Um, you know, it, when in uh, when Paul writes in Second Timothy, chapter four, verse five, he says this: "But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry." Uh, and 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 Jesus talks about this right in uh, in Matthew chapter. Uh, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, he says, You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And so the the idea is, like, he, we have something, not for ourselves. Uh, my salvation isn't exclusively for me. My salvation and the fact that I'm still here on this planet where there are other people who aren't is, is for the sake of others and how we can we can pour into others and how we can start to expand the church. You know, even this, Bill, this, is, this has been uh, very convicting to me, you know, especially we're coming into political season and things is – is we're we're so worried about the direction that the world is going, and and rightfully so, in our country, and rightfully so, uh, but we live in a country to where uh, to where people um, and people in different positions of power and authority they make decisions, and people vote for those individuals, and 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 so really the issue when your nation and your leadership is going into a negative direction is not enough people believe in Jesus. I've seen some statistics recently that are incredibly um, heartbreaking, where I think that uh, there was one recently where the specific poll said something like 37% of evangelical Christians believe in a biblical worldview. And and so we wonder why the world is going awry. It's because people don't know Jesus. Uh, Abortion is a problem because people don't know Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is the world that we live in and the most effective thing that we can do to change the direction of the country that we live in is to share Jesus easily the most effective. Um, let me share this this one thought here. So uh, recently, uh, Richard Dawkins came out and he uh, 
he he said he's a world famous atheist for those of you atheist philosopher for those of you who might not know and he came out and he said how much he appreciates that he lives in a Christ, culturally Christian nation. Mm-hmm. I remember him saying that. Yeah, and and uh, and it's an interesting statement, right? Because he he loves all the benefits of being in a Christian nation, but yet he opposes Jesus. Yeah, and it's like this. I, I heard a, an apologist, uh, an online apologist, mention this. He said he said it's like being uh, an a uh, somebody who loves apples. Loves apples, can't get enough apples, eats apples all the time. He loves apples so much that they move into the middle of an apple orchard. And then they realize that all these trees are kind of burdensome, all these apple trees. And so they, they, they start to cut them down, you know, build their home there. And the apple, the trees are giving too much shade. So let's cut down all of them, make sure they're gone. And then all of a sudden there's no more apples. I mean, the <laughs> thing that they enjoy are gone. Yeah. And, and so the, the reason that people love living in a nation that at least historically or culturally was Christian is because of that Christian foundation. And, and so what happens is we've become so comfortable living here because it's been so easy and so nice to live here for so many of us that we forgot that we have to fight for the gospel to be able to establish a place to live that's good. You see, uh, a nation will only be good if the people are good. And, and we aren't good. Uh, we, we, we need Jesus. And so the more and more of us that have Jesus, the better decisions that we would make. Mm-hmm. Trevor Rubenstein is my guest. Uh, Trevor, one thing I, I always thought was a, a good way of doing a self-diagnostic is if I can answer these two questions. If I said to myself, what was the last thing the Holy Spirit got my attention with in a fresh way when it comes to studying God's Word? And then when was the last time I shared my faith with someone? Can I name the person, the time, and the place? And if I can't answer those two questions, I, I wonder if my pulse is strong. Oh, wow. That's really good, Bill. Uh, I, I can answer both of those I want to hear. I want to hear. Right. Yeah. Um, so recently I was really fortunate to be able to take a friend of mine that's uh, that has a very serious a cancer diagnosis to treatment, and this person's not a believer in Jesus. And I was able to share with them, Bill, about why I don't fear death, and it was very important and very moving for them. Wow. Um, this was yesterday. Oh wow! And uh, and and then and it, what what struck me out of this? Okay, this is what struck me is actually I heard a response from a mutual friend as to what that person thought. They said that they love and appreciate me, but I'm trying to convert them. Okay, this was the terms that they used, and this struck me because Bill. I'm not trying to win somebody to something that's my side versus their side. I love them, Bill, and I want them to have eternity with Jesus. It's not about my side versus yours. It's I love you, and I know this is real, and I just want you to have this gift. So good. So good. What a fantastic conversation, Trevor. And uh, Trevor Rubenstein is my guest, and you can learn more about Trevor at Chosen People Ministries dot com. Chosen People Ministries dot com. We've had a whole conversation this hour about how important it is to be reminding yourself all the time to have a word of hope, a word of invitation on your lips, because we live in such a broken, sad world with so much loneliness and depression and anxiety and stress and this is the hope we have in Christ that we need to share with others. Because when we started the hour, Trevor, Trevor, we talked about the the anxiety that I feel pretty much whenever I see or hear about someone who's who's died, who has died apart from Christ, and the unimaginable horror that they face. Yeah, and, and that does not even get that. That is so much greater anxiety, Bill, than it is to share with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. And again, it can be just as simple as, can I pray for you? Mm-hmm. It can be just as simple as, how are you doing today? It can, it can ask them, oh, did you go to church this weekend? Mm-hmm. What is your faith background? Who yeah. is Jesus to you? Just these simple questions, Bill. Yeah, so good. All right, Trevor, thank you for uh, spending time with me today. I love getting you solo, just so you know. I mean, I love you on the panel with at least two Jews and a Gentile, but it's really nice to just get some one-on-one time with you. Uh, Bill, it's always a blessing to and, be here. And I really love your passion for sharing your faith, and uh, the stories you tell me are amazing. 
All right, that is uh, all the time we have with Trevor, chosenpeopleministries.com. We're going to take a little break. Hour two is just on the way. Thanks for listening. Programming like this is made available through your support. Information available at myfaithradio.com.